There was a song that used to be sung in churches called Old Time Religion. It went something like this. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good enough for our mothers. It was good enough for our mothers. It's good enough for me. Makes me love everybody. And it's good enough for me. It will take us all to heaven. And it's good enough for me. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. And so many people think <clears throat> that if they get religion, then God will be pleased with them and everything's going to be okay. You know, maybe, and maybe your parents were very religious and that's what you think you need too. But religion, you know, if you thought it was good enough for you, then maybe it will be good enough for God. If you just have religion, then you will love everybody and it will take you all the way to heaven. The problem is, religion is not what you need. Religion is not what will help you love everybody. It's not what will get you to heaven. Could even keep you from heaven. And religion is not what God has planned for you. Well, the Jewish Christians in the book of Hebrews have grown up under the law. And now they're starting to put their trust in Jesus. But they're facing persecution from Rome. And so they are thinking about going back to their old Jewish life and their old Jewish practices. And if they do that, you know, then Rome is probably going to leave them alone because the, Rome wasn't persecuting the Jews. But they were persecuting the Christians. And so they're nostalgic for their old, safe, comfortable, legalistic life that was familiar, but yet it was more of a burden to them than it was a blessing. They're losing sight of how much better life is in Jesus than in following all the Jewish practices. The story of the Bible is, is the story of every human being born as a sinful, broken person, estranged from God. And the other side of the story is God is holy, righteous, and perfect. Our relationship with Him is broken. What can we do to make it right? Well, you either put your faith completely in Jesus, or you try and do what you think you can do in your own power to save yourself. Satan comes along and he says, are you sure Jesus is enough? Maybe you should keep the law too. You know, try to be religious. Read your Bible. Pray. Go to church. Get baptized. Try to be good. Take communion. And make some sacrifices along the way. Give your money. Give your time. Give your surface. Trust Jesus, but also do. And it's a long list of doing. That's religion. That's not relationship, which is what our life in God is all about. That's you trying to control your life rather than surrendering your life. All those religious practices can indeed grow your relationship with God, but they're not the same thing as living in Christ. Religion never saved anyone. Jesus came to save everyone who puts their faith in Him alone. The sad truth is, when, when society thinks about Christianity, what they're really considering is religion. Homer Simpson was asked what religion he belonged to, and he said, you know, the one with all the well-meaning rules that don't work in real life. Christianity. Well, the Church of Jesus Christ has nothing to do with religion. When people criticize the church, what they're really criticizing is the religion that has crept into the church. When Christianity gets mixed up with religion, it's no longer about Jesus Christ. As Tim Harlow says, religion is about what God wants from you. Jesus is about what God wants for you. Now, there are a lot of religions in the world. A religion is any spiritual system where you have to do certain things to make yourself good enough to please the God you serve. In religion, you believe that by your actions, you can bridge the gap that exists between you and God. The message of religion is, is always, about, always about trying harder and doing better. A religion is any spiritual system where Jesus is not enough. If, Jesus plus, if it's Jesus plus anything else, that is religion. 
What is true Christianity? Jesus is everything. Jesus is enough. There's a big difference between religion and a redeemer, between trying to be good enough and trusting that Jesus is enough. Jesus is better than religion. That's the point the author is making in Hebrews chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. He says, the point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by men. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve in a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. That is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, See to it that you make everything according to the pattern that I showed you on the mountain. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one, and it is founded on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, and we're talking basically about the Old Testament, no place would have been sought for another, but God found fault with the people. So Hebrews has already talked about how Jesus is better than any priest. Now the writer talks about how Jesus is the better way, the only way to relate to God. As Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And so the Old Testament system was provisional. It was, it was temporary. It pointed ahead to something better. It's what God put into place until the coming of Jesus. And one of the things it showed was no matter how hard we try to do the right thing, we're always going to fall short. Now, nothing was wrong with the old covenant. You know, nothing was wrong with the law. The problem was, and the problem is, we are powerless to keep it by ourselves. We, we can't live the way God wants us to live. And so that's why verse 8 says, God found fault with the people. So the law wasn't faulty. The problem was with the people. We are faulty. Even being on our best behavior is not good enough. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, Others see that which is good in me, and they see me only at my best. I shudder when I realize how unworthy I am and how ignorant they are of the dark and hidden recesses of my soul where all that is devilish and hideous reigns supreme, at times breaking through onto the surface and causing a turmoil that only God and I know. You see, we're all broken. Our lives have been shattered by sin. So now what if I told you that the only way you can address that problem is that you have to be perfect from now on. Has that worked for you up till now? Does that make you feel hopeful? Or does it make you feel more hopeless? It's probably going to make you feel hopeless because it ultimately depends upon yourself. But what if I told you there's a covenant out there that God has made with Christ that he lets us in on that's permanent it's assured, it's authentic, it's guaranteed to endure. It's not like the old covenant, you know, keeping all the old rituals and laws. It addresses my brokenness. It makes up for my sinfulness. The only thing that it demands from me is that I trust, that I trust God. If such a covenant exists, a covenant that God would make, where he keeps both sides of it, he fulfills the demands that it places upon you, and at the same time, he gives you the re rewards for meeting the demands. <laughs> Isn't that the absolute best deal you've ever heard of? Wouldn't be, you be foolish not to accept that from God? And so the old legal covenant was, was a copy of the real thing, a shadow of the reality that brings true salvation. The old earthly tabernacle and temple were only copies of the real sanctuary. You know, people think that when you go to church, you meet with God there. But, you know, you don't have to go to a, a building to meet with God. What we call God's house 
is not a church facility. It's not something that can be built with man-made hands. Now, I'm not saying that when we meet in church and gather together that God's not there. But God is with you everywhere. He's not just in the church building. The greater sanctuary is in heaven where Jesus sits next to God. At the right hand of God is the position of authority. It's only when Jesus is allowed to be the final authority in your life, the Lord of your life, that it can be said that you've entered the true sanctuary where you're meeting with God. But there is for now an earthly sanctuary where you can meet from God and where he rules. But as I said, it's not a building. The temple of God in this world is your heart. Well, the Israelites had tried to keep their law and follow the rituals without considering the real meaning and understanding of what they pointed to. They were very religious in their external sense, you know, doing all these things. They could observe every religious practice. The problem was their heart was not in it and God was not ruling in their heart. And so the focus was on keeping all these rituals rather than having a relationship with the God of the universe. If you try to keep God's law by merely following the practices that you need to do, and it doesn't come from your heart, it doesn't take up room in your heart, you're going to have a difficult time. You're going to keep coming up short. You're going to be weighed down. You'll end up living more like a Pharisee who's doing all the right things than as a son or daughter of the king who has a right heart. And so the writer is saying to the Jewish Christians who are thinking about going back to their old ways, do you see how much better salvation in Christ is? If you go to Jerusalem three times a year, offer all the sacrifices, keep the law, follow the commandments, trust those sacrifices, get all the yeast out of your house on the Passover, you do this and you do that and all these things, then you'll finally live. Well, I don't know if I'd call that living. And no matter what you do, there would always be more to do. It would never be enough. And so why would you go back to living under the law? And then when you hear about Christians who think, well, wouldn't it be great if, if there was a third temple built in Jerusalem and we started offering sacrifices again? Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to go back to that? Jesus, this man, he offered one sacrifice for sins and for set down forever at the right hand of God and said, it is finished. Your salvation was forever accomplished on the cross. And so the old covenant sacrifices could not take sin out of the human heart. The old covenant sacrifices couldn't change your heart. But Jesus did something far better than any earthly sacrifice could ever do. He offered himself. There's no better sacrifice that you can put that can put you in better standing with God than the one that Jesus offered. The sacrifice of Jesus cleanses your heart from sin. The sacrifice of Jesus, in fact, gives you a new heart. The sacrifice of Jesus gives you power over sin. The sacrifice of Jesus gives you the power to have a relationship with God, a heart relationship, so that you can live in a way that pleases Him. Well, the Galatians were another church group who tried to go back to the simple but impossible system of religious law. Paul reminded them that Jesus has freed them from that burden. Writing to the Galatians in Galatians 2, 19-21 from the message, he says, I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a lawman so that I could be God's man. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion or am driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm not going back on that no matter what. So Jesus accomplishes something new in you. 
And this is what the writer of Hebrews says, going on now in Hebrews 8, verse 9. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my new covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their sins and remember their wickedness no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. Back in December 1980, or 1967, rather, Time magazine included an article with the title, Surgery, the Ultimate Operation. It was the story of the first human heart transplant performed for, by Dr. Christian Bernard in South Africa on Lewis Washkansky, who was dying of clogged arteries after having two heart attacks. After 36 hours following the surgery, he was eating, and a week later he was even joking around with reporters as he gave an interview. But in the end, his regimen of immunosuppressant drugs and treatment was not enough. He died of pneumonia 18 days after surgery. You see, what we need is a heart transplant, but one that lasts, one that changes us from the inside out. Jesus received the old covenant penalty for our sins so that we could receive the new covenant blessing of Him. In Christ, God has made a new covenant with you. There were three things about this new covenant. There was a new priest, there was a new power, and there was a new people. And actually, there was a fourth thing that enabled all the old, those other things to, to work, and that was a new heart. Jesus gives you a new heart. Jesus is a new priest who gives you a new heart and fills you with a new power that can make you a new person. But religion wants to see your report card. You know, how are you doing and performing, following all the laws? Jesus wants to see your heart. When you accept the gift of the Holy Spirit, that's when you begin to get the gift of a heart change. When God looks at you, he sees the heart of Jesus, and he remembers your sins no more. The writer quotes Jeremiah when he promises, when God promises a new covenant and a new heart. And then, through Ezekiel, God says something very similar. Ezekiel chapter 11, And I will give them one undivided heart and put a new spirit within them. And I will take out the heart of stone, their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my commandments and keep my ordinances and do them. Then they will be my people, and I will be their God. The new spirit is what gives us the new heart, which gives us the new power that we need for living a new life. As Robert Saucy says, the orientation of our heart's love towards God gives us the ability for the first time to live according to what He desires, to live righteously with our neighbors and even ourselves. Prior to our new heart, we lived out of the love of our old heart, which was ultimately turned in upon itself. There was no way we could fulfill God's law of love. In the words of Scripture, we were slaves to sin. The new covenant still involves law-keeping, because God wants you to love Him and obey Him. The difference is in how it happens. Under the Old Covenant, you were trying to keep these laws and do what was right by yourself. In the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit is poured out on every person who puts their trust in Him and enables you to please God. As it says in Romans 5.5, 5, God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. Now you can live for God in a way that you couldn't do before. Through the Spirit, we can now, as Peter says, participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. The Holy Spirit 
ruling in the temple of your heart is the only true life changer. Dallas Willard said, spiritual formation for the Christian basically refers to the spirit-driven process of forming the inner world of the human self in such a way that it becomes the inner being of Christ himself. Christ-likeness of the inner being is not a human attainment. It is finally, in the last resort, it's the gift of God. God wants to give you the gift of a new heart, his heart. There's only one priest who can make that happen. But you've got to let him be the priest of your life. You've got to let him be the Lord of your life. And that's Jesus. The old way of the old covenant is no longer necessary, and it didn't work anyhow. The new way to a new heart and a new life is Jesus. In Jesus, God takes his law, his word in the Bible, and he writes it on our heart. He pours out the Holy Spirit in your life and changes you from the inside out. But you've got to put his word in your mind, and then the Holy Spirit will take the word and use it to change your heart. With a changed heart and a new power, the power of the Spirit, you can live a new life. You can live the life of Jesus. The first covenant was do this and you'll die. But the new covenant is believe this. Trust in him and you will live. The old covenant was conditional. Not on God's, God's part, but on our part. God will always love us, but we don't always love him or others. Conditional relationships don't last because they break the conditions. And then the relationship is affected, if not severed. The people could not keep the old covenant, so what happened? It broke their relationship with God and distanced them from him. When they sinned, he turned his face away from them. But the new covenant is unconditional. On the cross, Jesus says, I love you. No ifs, ands, or buts. I'm absolutely and unconditionally committed to you. I was so intimate with you that I nailed myself to you on that cross. I took your place so that you could live in my place. Because of that, you can approach me just as you are. You will never be enough, but I will always be be more than enough. Before you loved Jesus, he loved you. It takes tremendous humility to accept that you have nothing to do with Christ loving you. Christ's love is not based on your devotion to him. It's based on his devotion to you. And so I hope you wake up to the fact that he profoundly loves you and you have nothing to do with it. Instead of asking, why would he do that? You should say, wow, look at what he's done. Why would you want to go back to trying to do it yourself? When with a new heart, you can go forward in your life and in your relationship with God. Pursue a heart relationship with God. Because he will never fail you. And so... Jesus, this morning, we come to you just as we are. And you accept us just as we are. You come into our life, and we invite you to come into our life in any way you need to today, whether it's for the first time or in a more complete way that we surrender ourselves to you. Because, Lord, you are always enough. May we, our confidence be in you. May our trust today be in you. And Father, as you live in us, as we allow you to have your way with us, we pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that you'll make us into the very image of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.